Is that you, Chris? Yeah. Hey, look at you. Handsome fella. Look at the hair there, buddy. I like it. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, man. Where, where, uh, I'm Tom Fon. <laughs> yeah. Where, where, where are we talking from? Where are you? I'm in May. I'm outside of Minneapolis. Oh, Minneapolis. You know, Dorothy and I are supposed to go to the, um, convention in May. Yeah. I was just talking to Wendy Powell and she told me that. Yeah. I, I, is everything going, uh, I'm so freaked out about the COVID and all that. I, is everything still going ahead? Are people going to conventions? Yeah. They are. You have a, you have a Beatlesque haircut, kind of a George Harrison. I love it. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> How are you, man? Good. Thanks for uh, going to do this. Yeah. I did some research on you. I turned the tables, Chris. Oh. And not only have you uh, interviewed my lovely wife, uh, Dorothy, but man, Jeff Nimoy, Michael Sorich, those are like my, uh, my brother Jonathan and I have lunch with Sorich and Nimoy like once a month. Those are the, those are hilarious guys. You got Richard Epcar, Wendy Lee, you got all the legends, buddy. Yeah, I was the first person to do a Bob, Bob Klein like the other week too. I love Bob Klein. He's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> the, they, everyone's probably on good behavior with you, but, you know, actors are, um, are children, you know? So like when we go in the VO, uh, it's like Looney Tunes, especially if we're all together, you know? Yeah. So I can just kind of start from the beginning then and um, okay. ask, did everything start from Frankenstein General Hospital? Wow, that was my first on-camera uh, credit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I grew up in uh, Huntington, Long Island, New York, mm -hmm. which is a, a wonderful like small town about 45 miles east of New York City. And everyone refers to New York City as the city. Hey, you going into the city? Are you, doing, are you going to the city? I'm going to the city. So my folks were from Brooklyn. My dad was a drummer, a jazz musician. So my brothers and I, I'm one of four. And everyone's in the entertainment industry. I mean, you may know my brother, Jonathan Fawn. He's on Naruto. My sister, Melissa Fawn, Cowboy Bebop legend, and so many other things. And my older brother, let's not forget him, Chris. My older brother, Mike Fawn, is a, a wonderful trombone player, jazz musician, well-known. So we grew up in New York, and we went to see Broadway shows. I'm trying to connect it to Frankenstein General Hospital. I, I wanted to be an actor since I was a kid. Yeah, because yeah. when I turned the TV on, it looked like there was a party going on, you know, whether it was the Three Stooges in black and white or uh, watching television. Uh, I'm, I'm old as the hills. The Dean Martin show or variety shows where people were laughing. Johnny Carson, The Tonight Show. It looked like a big party, but I didn't know how to get into that party. And when they started taking us to Broadway, I was like, oh, I see. So these are just actors. That's what it is. So that's. But Frankenstein General Hospital, oh my God, I've got like two or three lines in that. And uh, that was right before anime. That's the late 80s. Right. I worked with a, I've always worked in post-production. I'm an actor who also works in post-production. That's just whatever. And I run out to do the gigs. And I worked with a guy named Victor Garcia. And if you look Victor Garcia up, he's a wonderful actor. He plays um, Edward James Almost's son, in Stand and Deliver. So I worked with Victor Garcia in post-production. He was an actor and I was an actor. And another guy who worked with us was Steve Bloom. Yeah. We, were all, we were all just guys who wanted to be actors or musicians. And uh, Victor Garcia was our boss in the mailroom at Empire Films in post-production. Empire Films made these like B-movies, uh, Reanimator and From Beyond. And anyway, a couple of years later, he calls me, he calls Dorothy, he calls Steve Bloom. He goes, I'm no longer in post-production. I'm producing Japanimation. You ever heard of it? I go, I have no idea. What are you talking about? And this is like 1990, 91, 92. It's that second really big wave of right. anime. And so we, that's how we got into the Giver and Orgus and Macros. That's where I started. So then that was right after Frankenstein General Hospital. Mm -hmm. Was that also how you would have gotten to SAG then too, or is that a separate story? Uh, it's a separate story. Frankenstein General Hospital, I don't think was even a union gig and I was not a union actor, but I got my SAG card playing Buster Keaton in an industrial for the Ford Motor Company. So an industrial is like a film that's made to not be shown to the public. Yeah. 
just for like a corporate thing, you know, every corporation has, has industrials like in-house. This was a, this thing is wobbling. It's like, I'm on the Titanic. Okay. Nice and slow here. Come on. I got Chris here. Behave. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I, I, there was a thing called the drama log and that was now, it's now backstage, but the drama log was this magazine that every actor read yeah. to look for aud auditions. And it said, uh, Buster Keaton lookalike. Now, Buster Keaton was a silent film comedian. He did great stunts and he was very thin, almost like a, they, he was so skinny. Even back then, I wasn't as skinny as him, but I like to do pratfalls and make a fool of myself. So I just went to the audition. I figured, what the hell? And they liked me and they cast me. <clears throat> and the producer on this, this is how I got my SAG card. The producer on it said, so Tom, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to be? I said, man, I'm trying to get going in the business. I want to get my SAG card. This was not a SAG gig. This, uh, I think it was Frankenstein General Hospital and then this Buster Keaton thing. Okay. And like, no, I want to get my union card. You know, I want to get going. He's like, oh, I'll make this a SAG gig. I'll taft Hartley you. That's the law. Though. And you'll work your butt off for me. I said, that sounds great. That guy's name was Peter Trainer, and he mm -hmm. directed some horror movies. But so I met Buster Keaton's wife, Eleanor Keaton. She was 20 years older than him. She was a showgirl. She had stories about the entertainment industry. And I would leave her little apartment in North Hollywood and she'd go, oh, take a look at that hat over there. That's Buster's hat. I'm like, shouldn't this be in the Smithsonian? She goes, well, I kept one of them, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and the VO on it, the voiceover on this. So the thing is done. And I, they, they, they edit in clips of Buster Keaton driving a Model T with me dressed as Buster Keaton driving the new Ford for 1989 or whatever it was. They, and it was the narration was Lawrence Olivier. Wow. And it was his last gig before he died. Because Peter Trainer, the, the director on this thing, he's like, Buster Keaton's my favorite comedian. So I want, to, I want all licensing to all Buster Keaton movies. And Olivier is my favorite actor. So I wanted him to do the voiceover. And he got everybody he wanted. So here I am, just a little piece of the puzzle. But I got my SAG card uh, okay. then. Yeah. And then all the anime came around the corner. Mm. Am I talking too much? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> I might be the perfect guest for you. <laughs> well, I know you got to be the lead in uh, Out, Outlanders as well. And that still has a pretty good following. Outlanders, why are you going way back? You know, Dorothy made me print up some of these things that we bring to conventions and stuff. Yeah. Because lots of, I can't remember a lot of things that I've done <laughs> <laughs> unless something really insane happens or whatever. But I know Outlanders is mid 90s. It's still popular now. Mm -hmm. Am I on that with like Dorothy and Steve Bloom and my sister Melissa? Yeah. For, for a while there, we saw, we would see the same actors out at, uh, magnitude eight they were they were the only anime game in town in the early 90s kevin seymour who's passed away rest in peace he directed everything yeah les claypool the third was the engineer he's hilarious he's still out there with his lovely wife mary and the actors were me dorothy melissa jonathan the fawn family right steve bloom victor garcia david hart uh uh I can see the names, all these, it was just a small crowd of us. And then it started becoming, you know, bigger and bigger. And Brian Cranston right. uh, did, did some anime in the beginning. You got to get him uh, on an interview, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was back in July. I was the first to do Bridget Hoffman and that was amazing. I love Bridget Hoffman. I worked for her on, um, she's a doll. I used to be in a Walla group with her. Do you know what Walla is? Yeah. So all the actors are in a room and, you're giving voice to the background right so the lead the lead people are talking but in the background you see people at a table you know so they'd be like all right tom you and bridget are that couple and you'd be like so what's going on how's it going and they take your audio and mix it down mm -hmm. it, it, it was it's almost like is it really needed because you can't even hear but back in the early days of film i, I believe they had the extras just say walla to each other walla 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 <laughs> And that's why they're called Walla Groups now. But, you know, but Bridget and I were in a group for a guy named Bert Sharp. And then afterwards, she was working on, uh, oh, my God, I played the school teacher on Blood, The Last Vampire. Right. Bridget is in that. And she cast that as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm the principal in that. Oh, Bridget's a doll. She's married to a wonderful actor. Riff. Right. Riff. Riff Hutton. They're such a great, they're a lovely couple. Wonderful.
look at you. And I heard you interviewed uh, Tawny Katane, rest in peace. Oh, yeah. And did, so you, the, did you get to um, meet her when you were on America's Funniest People? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I won. Don't tell anyone because I don't have the money anymore. But I won uh, the $10,000 prize twice on oh. America's Funniest People with different groups of people. We, we had like a skit. Uh, I was in a stand-up with a great friend of mine, Dan Lorger. He did a lot of VO, but he's since moved to Reno. But he was on, um, he was on all the stuff that we were on, if you ever look him up. He worked all the way up to about 2000, and then he and his family moved to Reno. But he's on a lot of anime, Dan Lorger. And we did stand up for a while because we met in college and we did a bunch of impressions. And we had this bit called Al Pacino on a game show. I, I should post all this stuff on YouTube because it's really, it's, it's really short and really funny, right? Um, perfect for the Tic Tac now. That's what I call my daughter. I go, what are you watching, Tic Tac? Daddy, Tic Tac. Anyway, um, old as the hills. Um, <laughs> Dan and I were on America's Funniest People, Al Pacino on a game show. And it was me playing him blind in Scent of a Woman, you know, uh, hoo ah, hi -o, ho, ho, ho. You know, I had to answer all these questions and uh, it won 10,000 bucks. And Tawny Katane was so sweet to us. And then, like a year later, I was with a bunch of other people. Anybody can tell a joke. And it was all these people telling a joke terribly. And the audience loved it. And I was one of three on that, I guess. And I, and I won that. I won a little piece of the 10,000 again. And we met her again. And, she was so sweet, man. Gorgeous and really nice. And she was married to the angel pitcher at that time, uh, yeah. Chuck Finley, I think. Chuck Finley or Mark Langston, I, one of those guys. Yeah. I'm sorry if I mixed that up. Yeah, she was very nice to us. And Dave Coulier was the was the host with her. Mm -hmm. Dave, yeah, he was from the, the Full House Bob Sackett connection there. You know, yeah. crazy. Look at you interviewing people out of your home in Minneapolis. I love it. <laughs> Well, and I, uh, considering um, the since you had the the, uh, the lead part in August too, how did you personally take the dubbing? Well, uh, when we were doing August too, uh, you're going way back. You did your research. I I, I applaud you. Um, we worked at a place called. You're not going to believe this. It was called. My God, I should eat more before I do these. Um, uh, I can't remember the name. But it was in a. It was on Ventura Boulevard, and it was a studio uh, at the at the at close to a like a little hill. The backyard. It was wide open, oh. <laughs> and they put all the voiceover actors in the same room together, which is the way they do regular animation. You know, it's more like a radio play. But for anime, when you're trying to sync over the Japanese, you have to go one actor at a time because you're going to hear every. You know what I'm saying? So back in the beginning days. Um, the hill, the hut. I'm, try I'm trying to remember the name of the studio. It became uh, obvious that we cannot record Orgus there, so we went to uh, Les Claypool had a studio, and then it eventually became Magnitude Eight. But uh, yeah, those you're going way back to the early days, man. That's great stuff, man. Yeah. Guyver was great. You know what I remember more than anything was Guyver's death scene. But I think he died many times. There was a lot of Kaiva, you know, I was screaming and yelling and. Uh, yeah, he just, he was always in trouble, that poor guy. And, he, and then he wanted to save the day. And, you know, I went to a convention and signed the most beautiful Guyver poster. Whoever you are, you're out there. And I, I, I it was just gorgeous. I can't believe that people remember it. I, I just, what I like more than anything uh, in the characters is probably the vulnerability of the characters. The, the, uh, the wanting to do good, wanting to do right, you know, that's true for all of us. So, you know. And what do you think is the, on the total opposite side of that, what do you think is the darkest headspace you had to go for anime? Dorothy had me printed up. Hold on. It was about a year or two ago, and I was with, I think, Wendy Lee. And there's this guy on JoJo's Bazaar. Yeah. I think the character's name was Jay Giles or whatever. He's like a screaming nut job, psychopath. I mean, when I was done with that session, screaming and yelling and then finally he gets killed and it's, I don't want to give that away but you know he's just like a nut job just, like, <laughs> just over the top insanity for like a two hour session you leave you're sweating and your head is like but I'm like did you get it did you record it is it all there did you get it you know so it was that it was the part I played on Jojo bizarre yeah truly bizarre that show my god <laughs> that one that's the opposite of Guyver yeah
Yeah. Yeah. And these were some other early ones. Um, do you remember being, I think they were just like incidental parts, but um, in Black Magic and uh, Lily Cat and. I don't remember those. Was I good? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> If I was good, that's all that matters. You know, a guy came up to me at a convention and said, dude, you're in one one punch. Man, yeah. You're in one punch, man, bro. You're, you're Crab Lante. I'm like, am I? He's like, bro, you got to start writing down your credits. <laughs> <laughs> and then he pulls it up on his iPhone. I'm like, yeah, that's me. My God, man. I, yeah, I just, you know, you know, Chris, I'm happy to get the gig. Mm -hmm. I go in and do the gig. And I want to do the best I can. And then I truly leave it. And, oh. I, and the sad thing is, like, Dorothy, she'll go to conventions. I go with her. She's the best. And I'm like, in episode 13 of this one, she's like, oh, yeah. She like, I don't know how, man. She <laughs> remembers this stuff. But me, it's like, phew, I just want to leave it in the, on the microphone. Leave it, leave it there. You know? mm. But some things I remember. Well, this is a more modern series, but one of my favorite roles of yours is um i know you took over the role from sam regal uh gunther and kyo karamao good stuff fun that's all i remember what, okay. was he a good was he a good guy please yeah. tell me he was a good guy the psychos that takes the life out of you i'm sorry <laughs> if i don't remember <laughs> some of them man well, that's okay do you remember these two let's see if you remember i don't know if you were going to ask me about them or not this is the only time dorothy and i worked together Oh, yeah, Gigi Mon and, yeah. And ba Baba Mon and Gigi Mon. Yeah. Hey, you're good, man, you know. <laughs> Mary Elizabeth directed that. Mm -hmm. She wanted us to play it like uh, Billy Crystal and Carol Kane in The Princess Bride. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we were like, oh, I love you so much. Yeah, it was good. That was funny. Yeah. Someone just sent us that. Like, are you on the Instagram and the Twitter and all those things? Yeah. Do you follow Dorothy at all? Yeah. Yeah, she's got a, people send things. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. You guys know more about my career, obviously, than I do. Yeah. <laughs> it's sad, isn't it? Well, and I know with um, with Agumon and Digimon, I, I asked the same question to Wendy Lee and Steve Staley. Did you, did you have a particular highlighted story of um, Michael Lindsay? Oh, Michael Lindsay. He's, he's funny, man. Uh, all I, the, My favorite story about Agumon, I go to these conventions and People come up to me and they say, uh, uh, they're, they're about, I don't know, you look really young. They, they're about maybe late 20s or 30, but you look so young, man. And and how old are you? <clears throat> I'm 24. Yeah, you are a youngster. The people will say, I came home from school. I turned on Fox Kids. <clears throat> I watched Digimon and Agumon's my favorite. And I'm so happy to meet you. And what I remember more than anything, Michael Lindsay and all these, is going to the first audition you picked whatever you wanted to read for. I wasn't coming in for Agumon. They had everything laid out. They had a little bit of the animation, like a you know drawing of Agumon, and then the dialogue. So I went in there, and I, I'm looking at the guy. I, I just picked him, and I thought he was kind of a sweet guy. I thought, look, at, look at this. He's kind of a sweet guy. Hey, 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 how's it going? Hey. So I was like going that way with it, and I get it. Now, years later, someone finally plays me the Japanese actor who does it in Japan, the original guy who's still doing it, I think. <clears throat> and his, uh, he's got like almost a Danny DeVito. Uh, yeah, his voice is down. I'm like, so I'm the complete opposite, you know? But uh, yeah, I remember Michael was around and uh, just everybody worked on Digimon. Oh my God. Uh, Colette and Dorothy, Sorich, Nimoy. Everybody was on Digimon, you know? Right. Bloom. Yeah, yeah. And is there a story that you have as well with a Felice sampler? Oh, Felice, she just was so sweet, Felice, rest in peace. She was so sweet and so lovely and so fun to work with and bubbly and um, <clears throat> just always fun, always fun. We would do the Walla groups together for Digimon mm -hmm. because they would, they would, sometimes you'd get a session and it's, they're like, no Agumon today, we just want you to do Walla. So they take all the people who were playing in Digimon, Felice, everybody, and we had to do a wallop session, but you know, with Michael Sorich directing, you know, it, <laughs> we, you're supposed to come in on the fourth beep. So you'll hear beep, 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 beep. Then you come in. But with Sorich, you know, joking around and everybody, you know, and then you hear the beep, beep. I'm like, quiet, I got it. You know, then with the beep, we all come in like, hey, what's going on? You know, so 
I just remember uh, Felice forever being on Digimon and so many shows, you know, it's, mm-hmm. you know, she was lovely. She's a lovely lady, very sweet. And what were your, um, when you had to come back as Agumon too, what were your thoughts about that? I was so happy. I mean, between you and me, I think they might be doing it again, but my phone didn't ring. Oh. But, you know, <clears throat> I think they're evolving him to another thing or something, you know. Mm-hmm. Digivolving, digivolving, digivolving. So, you know. But, yeah, I was thrilled. And then to do those, I didn't know there were going to be a couple of movies and stuff. And, and tying it in with COVID, <clears throat> strange way, COVID and everything shut down in March of 2020. Right. And I had my final Agumon session on that Monday. So Friday was March 13th, Dorothy's birthday, Saturday, Sunday. That Monday was my last session for the Digimon Try. Oh. Um, it was a great session. And the guy was filming me the whole time for the making of on the Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. But it was it was great. I, I didn't really get into the emotion that this might be the last Agumon or whatever, you know, because who knows? I didn't think I'd be doing them 20 years later, you know, so who knows what happens. But then COVID was happening outside. So it was like you were trying to like be focused and they were just, you know, everybody's in masks and it was just, it was, it was weird and strange, but I, you know, like me, I tune everything out once I get into the studio and like, I'm trying to focus on you, Chris, and your hair and just focus and give you the magic you need. So, yeah. You know, but yeah, that was a great session though. That was fun. I like those tribe movies. They're wild, man. Yeah. How about the original Digimon movie? Jeff Nimoy wrote and directed that one. That's a good one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's got everybody in that one. It's classic. You know, okay, let's cut to it, Chris. Uh, actors are lunatics. I said that, right? They're children. They're playful. So when you show up, no matter what's going on in your life, COVID could be happening outside. Whatever's going on in your life, in your personal life, when you get to the session, there's going to be a Michael Sorich or a Jeff Nimoy or a Wendy Lee or a Julie Maddalena directing you. And they're wonderful people. Mm-hmm. They're fun. And you know you can just not worry about anything and just leave it all, leave it in the record button. Leave it all there, you know. Julie's great. I've worked with her a lot. And I work with Wendy Lee on Cells at Work Code Black. Can I mention that? Yeah. <laughs> I just did. Are those shows on? Yeah, they're out. Oh, look at you. I need you, Chris. Why don't you be my agent, manager, publicist? You know what's going on. <laughs> if we come to Minneapolis, if it's if it's all good, will you come to the thing and see us? Yeah, yeah. Oh, did we meet you before? Did we meet you a couple of years ago at Minneapolis? No, I haven't been to any cons up here yet. Oh, okay. That was a, it's a fun one. This wonderful guy Ryan runs a bunch of them, and I guess the gal you talked to works for Ryan, I believe. Yeah. When okay. you think? Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. I just want to be safe. I said to Dorothy, do people want to meet me and Dorothy if we all have masks on? And Dorothy said, they're doing it now. Conventions are happening right now. So, yeah. well, come to the, if it's safe, people come to the convention, I'll sign anything. There we go. <laughs> well, on the topic of Eden Zero, yeah, you got to be like the big, big ogre troll. It's right. How do you know that? <laughs> Yeah, he was, uh, yeah, that was good. That was fun. I love that part. Mm-hmm. I had to go back a couple of times to tweak little things and stuff. And Yeah, that was a very fun part. He looks like he's really scary, but he's a good guy. Yeah. I would say to Julie, is this guy a good guy? She goes, oh, yeah, he's a good guy. <laughs> it was really fun. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny. I Maybe you know better than me, but I don't see a big, uh, maybe you, all the fans are going to jump on me here, but I don't see a big difference in the anime with what I'm recording now and what I recorded 20 years ago. I mean, has there been a big change in anime, in your opinion? It looks to me from a distance like anime. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. when I'm working on Eden's Eden Zero, I said to Julie, this could be something I'd worked on 20 years. I wouldn't know. I mean, yeah. Know, the basic core of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think um, this was again, like, well, later on, but I think you probably, like, you're the, the character you play in Bleach is, like, the most wholesome character in the whole series. Yeah, I was on Bleach, and I think my brother Jonathan was on Bleach, and sometimes the credits get get us uh, mixed up. <laughs> but, I, I, yeah, I don't remember a lot of what I did on Bleach. It's one of those things, they all, they all kind of bleach together. You know what I'm saying, Chris? Yeah. 
But I think that was a Mary Elizabeth. I'm not sure. I always remember the directors. Okay. I'm sorry. I can't give you more than that. I'm going to be completely honest with you, Chris. If I know it, if I remember it, I'm going to cue in. All right. If not, I'm going to say, Chris, help me out here. <laughs> well, this would have been really recent to um, playing Pilaf in Dragon Ball Z. Right. So it's the it's only running in Asia. Right. It, it, they had already dubbed it, right? And yet they wanted to dub it again in English for the Asia market. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm happy to do the gig, but like, I just heard a second of the guy who who did it, who I've been at conventions with, and I'm like, quite honestly, I don't know why. I was happy to do the gig, and I was pretty funny in it too. But I sound a lot like you, and we both sound a lot like the original Japanese. So yeah, that was fun. I did a convention once, and everybody wanted to ask me about that. And when they realized it was Asia, they're like, they were kind of bummed. They're like, oh. <laughs> That's not the one we listen to. Well, this is going back to on camera. Um, I did just want to ask what your experiences were on Wonder Years in Beverly Hills. I don't That's do so one great. I, I, you're, you're the only uh, podcast I've been on that is not, that is also asking me about my career, on camera career as well. Oh. Uh, so the Wonder Years, I remember I auditioned right, but I seem to book things, uh, on camera things, right around the end of the year. November or December. And my thought is they go through every actor in Hollywood and they go, oh, who's this Tom Fawn guy? Yeah, he's been around forever. Just, just, let's give him something. You know? <laughs> but I remember I went in for that. It was just what they call an under five, right? Five lines or less. Yeah. And I was funny at the audition. And then uh, I think then it was Thanksgiving. And then we shot in December. The Wonder Years were still on, you know, obviously it was a big hit on TV. I had to go out to a Pasadena to a, uh, like a used car lot. And uh, I had a trailer with my name on it. And they treated me like gold. And I said hello to Fred Savage and everyone. But my scene, I don't know if the scene is Fred Savage's character is going to buy his first used car. So him and his buddies are all there. And they go, we don't know if we should come to this place. And you see a uh, salesman, uh, kind of, there was a guy out here called Cal Worthington. Mm-hmm. He would come on TV at two in the morning. It's Cal Worthington and his dog Spot. Come on down to Cal Worthington and I'll sell you a car. So he was like kind of a weaselly kind of car dealer. Rest in peace, Cal Worthington. But uh, but everyone went to Worthington Ford. Anyway, so in the Wonder Years, a guy, me, is being hustled by kind of a slick used car dealer who's like, you're never going to get a better deal than this. I'm walking. I'm walking away. And I'm like, uh, okay, I'll take it. That was me. Like, I have, like, one or two lines. Uh, okay, I'll buy it. I'm not sure. Okay, I'll take it. And he goes, all right. And he kind of pushes me out of the way. He goes, and he waves uh, Fred Savage. Uh, what's his character's name? I'm, oh, my God, I haven't watched the one of you. So <laughs> he calls him over. So I'm, I'm establishing the kind of uh, weaselly car dealer that uh, Fred Savage's character is going to buy his first car. It was a great okay. scene, and they treated me so nice, and it's wonderful. I mean, you know, I'm, come on, man. I always wanted to be uh, an actor just wants to act. I didn't think I was going to do voiceovers, you know. It's just uh, you kind of fall into things, you know, and then then your career kind of goes the way you want to go. Like, I, I love doing voiceover. I love doing voiceover because you go in the closet, you put the thing over your head, and you record. You can look like a schlub if I didn't shave. I shave for you, Chris. But, you know, if I, you know, and, and during COVID, People have, you know, Dorothy turned the front closet into a voiceover booth. And yeah, we've been doing VO from home here. So, uh, but voiceover is great. And I'm not saying this in a bragging way, but you, you, it's pretty evident right away that you have, that you're good Mm -hmm. with voiceover. With on camera TV and film, you can be a terrible actor and they'll do take after take after take until they get it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But with voiceover, uh, you're not going to get the job unless you're good. Mm-hmm. You know, they have no time for you to, they're not going to help you really be better. Uh, I wor- uh, One of my first gigs, I don't know if you're going to ask me, it was something really great on something called What a Cartoon. Yeah. The Cartoon Network. And I, I was in something called The Boyd and the Woim, right? The Bird and the Worm. The mm-hmm. Boyd and the Woim. And I got cast in that. 
And Chris Zimmerman, who's a great voiceover director and casting lady. This is getting back to my point. So she casts me and she hears me. We're starting to do it. And she's like, all right, Tom, I know you can do this. You're here like on a one. I need you to go to 10. So maybe what I said earlier, they can help you be, you had to have the ability to get the gig. Right. And then they're going to pull you even further. A great director will take you places you don't even think you could go. So if you ever see that, it's playing now on YouTube 24 7. That's where most of my career is, Chris. But anyway, um, uh, what a cartoon, The Boyd and the Woim. I'm like this nerdy, uh, hi, uh, how's it going? This kind of nerdy, kind of Jerry Lewis kind of, oh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be going to California when we go. I had this voice that I created and they animated to the voice. It's pretty, it's the total opposite of anime. Anime, it's all set, the, the animation. You got to plug in, translate it into English with a character and sync it. Mm -hmm. But with real animation, you can just go crazy. As a matter of fact, Chris Zimmerman said, this is the loony bit. Bring it up to 10. Just let it go. And then they animated to me. So that was a really wonderful, one of my favorite experiences in my whole career was doing that, Boyd in the Warrior. Mm -hmm. um, so with a great director, they can take an already talented voiceover actor and bring them even further. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you can pull a guy off the street to do a commercial on TV. You just tell them what to say. Say it this way. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? They film you. They got it. They roll it on TV. You think you're a great actor. But, you know, that's just my point of view. Well, do you have an opinion of, um, like, the modern generation of voice actors that are in anime now? I think, I'll be honest, I think everyone's great, to be honest with you. I think they're, they're great. I've heard them. I've worked with them. They bring it. They grew up watching what we did, and they've taken it even further, and that's the way it should be. You know, when I was a kid, I came home from school. Remember how I told you that the, someone told me that they came home from school and watched Fox Kids? and watch Digimon and Agamon. I came home from school with my brother and we watched Bugs Bunny every day. Yeah. And Mel Blank was the voice of everybody. And those cartoons were already old then when I'm coming home from school because they used to play in movie theaters before the movies, Right. Bugs Bunny, right? They were shorts, um, but they were so funny and they're really for grownups. But I mean, when I watched Bugs Bunny, I was like, man, look at how much fun they're having. Yeah. I thought I, I thought I saw a booty cat. I mean, we all tried to do everything we were watching. I think Mel Blanc was a big influence on a lot of voiceover people, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are good questions, Chris. Oh, thank you. Your hair hasn't moved once. I'm sweating and, you know, the, the, the <laughs> table looks like it's the, the interviewing me on the Titanic. I mean, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> are you going to ask about Cowboy Bebop? That's one of my favorites. Yeah. Well, I know. Um, yeah, there's still... I've seen you talk it before. There's like, do you have an affinity with that character, even though it was just a one episode thing? I just remember it was, uh, it was, it was, it was real. It was dramatic. It wasn't like uh, Agumon or uh, though Agumon. Agumon has his moments though. It, it wasn't uh, over the top, insane. It was, it was real. It was a real guy wanting to be like Steve Bloom's character, like you know, and, and then and, and you know, when you go to the session, this is something maybe the fans are be interested in i don't i don't see the script you know yeah none yeah. of us know what's going to happen and usually they don't tell you they don't say you're going to die on this one they want you to work through much like the characters working through so when i'm playing rocco bonaro and cowboy bebop i'm working through the whole thing and then we get to it i'm like oh he dies they're like okay so then we then we do it and we record it and i've said this before and it's true mary elizabeth came out of the booth and she goes, you made me cry, Tom Fawn. You made me cry. <laughs> but I did it and never thought about it again until uh, someone someone in post-production who I was talking about anime, anime with, like, I would say five years later, they're like, dude, you're on Cowboy Bebop. You died on Cowboy Bebop. That's one of my favorite episodes. I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, and he pulls it up and he shows me it and I'm like, so once again, I'm just an idiot, Chris. I don't remember. Yeah, I walk out of the booth and I'm like, okay, on to the next one. You know, I didn't think we'd still be talking about things, but people come up to me at the conventions and it's amazing. You guys are amazing. But I wish you would bring the clip with me. Bring yeah. the clip with you and remind me because I don't know what's happened now. I'm kind of 
I'm one sandwich short of a picnic. I don't know what's happened, Chris. I'm forgetting stuff. What about you? Ever forget a really fun character in uh, Kakashi? It was like I a, remember Kakashi. It's over the top, very over the top, right? Yeah, it's like the, the ghost that likes some um, baking. Well, you know me. I'm not shy, Chris. They, I can do the big over the top stuff. You know, if yeah. they want that. You know, I played another crazy psycho guy recently on shield hero but that's that's only the small title what's the full title of it rising of the shield hero rising of the shield Hero. i played a crazy sadistic nut job why do they cast me in this stuff what do you see crazy about me chris don't answer that <laughs> isn't it funny uh our daughter loves the anime too but she likes the japanese and i'm like you put, you're, putting your, you're putting your mom and dad out of business what's going on here yeah <laughs> Oh, this is another recent one. Um, really beautiful series of Forest of Piano. I love Forest of Piano. That was uh, Bob Buckholtz. Yep. Who's a wonderful director. And now his daughter's directing too. She's wonderful. And Bobby Buckholtz at SDI did that. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, I'll, I'll say uh, something funny about it. Um, uh, I'm playing a judge at a piano competition, right? on Forest of Piano, which is such an interesting show. The Japanese is so, so interesting because it's, it's all about what people are thinking. So I'm a judge and you hear me, my, my thoughts. Mm -hmm. So as a voiceover actor, I don't worry, I don't have to worry about the sync on the animation because it's a character just going, hmm, look at Chris play the piano, you know? And it, you're hearing his thoughts, you know? So doing the VO, it was just like doing a monologue and not worrying about having to move, you know, fit the sink. You know? mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a very deep show. Very, uh, very interesting show. Where's that? Is it on Netflix, I think? Yeah. Yeah, Forest of Piano. Yeah, yeah. You're good, Chris, boy. <laughs> what was your favorite anime growing up? Uh, well, my single favorite series is probably uh, Roroni Kenshin. Oh, Dorothy's on that, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Dorothy's on everything. Mm -hmm. Are you sure you have the right font here, Chris? <laughs> I also was on a great video game about a year. It came out about a year ago called Twin Mirror. Yeah. It's not anime at all, but it's really kind of wonderful. There's a small town. There's a murder. And I'm the editor of the newspaper. And the guy who was a great writer has to come back and kind of solve the crime of this murder in this town. And it's really dramatic and serious and not like anything I've ever done. So it's, I wish someone would play it and tell me how they liked it. Twin Mirror, it's called, but uh, I'm really good in that. And I just dubbed some, I'm not allowed to talk about it, but I'll just say it cryptically. I, I did some mob TV series <laughs> dubbing it into English. Oh, okay. not, anim not anime, just yeah. straight dubbing, you know, and that's playing somewhere or whatever. So I'm still at it. You know, I still keep, I'm still at it, Chris, you know, and mm -hmm. I just had a great, uh, Warner Brothers auditioned about a week. You know, Dorothy and I both have agents, so we're always reading for stuff in the closet and submitting. And, you know, the it's very competitive uh, voiceover. You know, it's uh, we're in Los Angeles. I mean, it's just a million, a million choices, you know. So when you finally get something, book something, you need to be grateful and happy that you're the one that they selected, you know. So because it's a tough business i would say to anyone starting out go to uh go to chicago which is it's not as big as la but it's but it's big or go down to texas isn't that where it's all happening now funmation woo, woo, woo. you know right. but of course people are there's probably a major go to a smaller town if they're if, and try and do it you know minneapolis have any anime there or voiceover or or acting work there i mean you know, um before you... not nothing anime but there's uh <laughs> I guess it's like the, I guess Minneapolis is like the biggest place for non, non-union voiceover stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> that seems to be everywhere now. Yes. <laughs> but there's just so many actors and, and people are good, man. People are really good. I just do what I can do, man. You know, I just, yeah. I just do what I can do, you know? <laughs> so do you have a good answer? Because um, my, my final question is always asking, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh my God, man. You're hilarious. My <laughs> legacy. That's pretty deep. You're a deep mofo, Chris. And I mean that with all love and respect. Uh, he, you know, he, 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 he tried, he gave it a shot. He, he, uh, he, uh, he left it. He left it all in the room. How's that, man? He left it all in the room on the press record. Tom Fawn, press record. 
There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I always wanted to be an actor. I, and I think I've joined the party, but you always want more. But as you get older, you realize you can't really control your career. Mm -hmm. You can put it out there. Man, I've left audition. I've done like voiceover auditions where I'm like, oh my God. I mean, that was pretty funny. And I play it back to Dorothy. She's laughing. I'm like, oh my God. Now Dorothy's laughing. We play it to a friend of mine. I send it to a friend of mine. He goes, yeah, it's funny, man. So I'm like, all right. So a casting director has to get this, right? You play these games. A casting director will get this and go, this guy's funny. Mm -hmm. And then and things come and go because they're listening to so many it's not right for whatever reason but i had one agent say this to me and i'll I'll leave this for you it's kind of you want to make fans wherever you go i mean you know fans of the casting people fans of the directors fans of the engineers just if you don't book this one maybe they'll think of you down the line like hey give me that tom fawn guy he can't really remember his credits from years ago but he's a good guy he's funny he's talented give me the tom fawn you know so Mm -hmm. Try and make fans. Have I made you a fan, Chris? Or you you already were one? I, I was already, yeah. <laughs> Did we cover it all? You feeling good? Well, I was just going to ask. It's kind of related to that. But um, has there been a case where you've gotten, uh, if there's like a single one where you've gotten fan fan stories of how Agumon helped them get over something? or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. It gets very touching. It's very, very sweet. Someone at a convention said to me that they were like, I think, homesick or something when they were a kid and watching Agumon and really helped them out. And I, and I think it got even more serious. And then at one convention, someone asked me to call somebody and leave an Agumon message, mm-hmm. which I did, you know, Hey, Chris, how's it going? Okay. Make sure you don't get pepper breath. Okay. Bye-bye. You know, whatever. And while the guy was at the convention, his friend called back had gotten the message from me and wanted to talk to me. So I'm like, okay. So I took a break and I talked to this guy who told me this whole story. He's like, dude, Agamont, you know, saved my life or got me through something. I, I'm so happy to talk to you. I'm like, yeah, man, whatever I can do, you know. Yeah. See, that's what you're talking about right now is really the icing on the cake because, you know, like I said, we want to make a buck and pay our bills. When we want to work, mm-hmm. we want to work and you go and you do it and you bring is you know insanity agamon pepper breath whatever you got to do you leave it you go you get mailed a check you pay your bills you move on five ten twenty years ago people are coming up to you and saying dude that voice you did i mean that's that's a pretty insane legacy right there man you know that you just if i can make people happy how's that making people happy that's a good thing yeah. in this world now more than ever yes making people happy is a good thing man yeah good well thanks i'm proud that we got to do this yeah man fantastic anyway i hope i gave you everything you wanted and uh i wish you and your family all the best man thanks and uh if we come to minneapolis which dorothy says we're coming and i'm like all right just let's wait to see what happens she's like you know let's get out there and i'm like let's just wait and see what happens but uh i'll email you before we go i know you'll know about it by then yeah all right uh, because we'd like to see in person yeah yeah All right. right. Thank you. Take it easy then. Okay. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you.